Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to today's Art Bite. My name is Ann Wolf, and I'm the uh, Chief Curator and Associate Director here at the museum. It's really my pleasure today to introduce um, one of our state's most amazing art historians and a good friend of the museums and mine, Brett Van Hoosen, uh, who's going to be giving a talk in conjunction with our current exhibition, Picasso in Clay, selections from the Robert Felton and Lindsay Wallace collection. And I will uh, get the pleasure of introducing her today. We have a great audience, so thanks for coming. Uh, Dr. Brett Van Hoosen is Associate Professor and Area Head of Art History at the University of Nevada, Reno. She trained at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, the University of Iowa, and the Humboldt Universität in, Ber in Berlin. Uh, Dr. Van Hoosen has written for journals including the New Art Examiner, N Paradoxa, and NACA, Journal of Contemporary African Art. Her areas of specialty and research include German art, Dada, sound art, African art, global contemporary art, and aspects of museum studies. In 2019, she received Nevada Humanities Outstanding Teaching of the Humanities Award. She recently guest curated the exhibition, 36 Views of Japanese Art at the Lilly Museum of Art at UNR. I hope you had a chance to see it. It was a great exhibition, so congratulations. So um, I'm looking forward to your talk today on uh, Picasso ceramics. Welcome, Brett. And uh, Brett will take questions afterwards and she'll go ahead and facilitate that. Thank you, Anne Wolf. Thank you so much for your introduction and thank you to the audience for coming today. Uh, indeed, this is a lunch, uh, lunchtime Art Bite uh, lecture. It runs about 30, 35 minutes. And then there's ample time for your questions and discussion. And uh, don't be shy. That's one of my favorite um, components to art history in general is really getting a sense of what's on people's mind and the types of things you want to discuss uh, in conjunction with today's topic, which is lessons from Picasso's ceramics. So, you know, the topic of Picasso ceramics is something that um, has been in the news more recently. Um, I was able to learn a lot from current publications uh, on his work and kind of the collaborative process. And I do have an exhibition catalog that just came out um, in 2019. And if you are interested, you can come look at it after the lecture. Some of the uh, information about his collaboration, as well as his influences comes from that catalog. Um, and it's really opportune in terms of thinking about this exhibition and the selections that we have upstairs. Uh, I've put together this talk in kind of three sections to think about lessons, right? Lessons in general that we can learn um, from artists, but you know, even more particular from an artist who had a really long uh, trajectory and career. And I've divided it into the importance of playfulness and experimentation, the culture of collaboration, and then thinking about inspiration. Where does it come from? How does it manifest? Um, and the importance of talking about those um, influences on an artist's career. So we'll start with a quick fact sheet, sort of thinking about um, Picasso and ceramics as a topic. It's, um, like I said, something that comes into his life um, more prominently in the 1940s after uh, the Second World War. Uh, Picasso viewed in 1946 this ceramics exhibition in Valouris, a town in southern France that was known for its rich artistic heritage, specifically with ceramic arts. Um, and there he met fortuitously uh, Suzanne and Georges Ramier, who are owners of the Medora Ceramics Workshop. And they really helped to facilitate his work uh, in this medium. Uh, also were responsible for aspects of the sales of this medium, and that was kind of the collaborative agreement that they had. So Picasso worked for over 25 years, from 46 to 71, during which time he completed uh, nearly 4,000 objects or ceramic works, uh, as noted upstairs in the exhibition. He also uh, chose to make a permanent residence uh, in the south of France in uh, Bada Villa in 1949. There was able to establish a studio and that then enabled him to really have much more uh, of an engagement with ceramic arts. He also, I think it's interesting to note, did a series of drawings with a whole sort of generation of the works that we see, some of which you'll see here today. 
Uh, and those drawings date from 46 to 53. And so it's not as if, you know, he's just working with clay, he's oftentimes working kind of preparatory sketches. So that's a little bit of the fact sheet about Picasso and ceramics. So to start with the first topic, the importance of playfulness, playfulness and experimentation, I think it's really important uh, for us all to remember that uh, those two things are important for the creative process. Uh, and keeping grounded in that idea of playfulness and experimentation is something that was characteristic of Picasso's long career. I think part of it comes from the fact that he was trained very early on, partially by his father in a very academic tradition. And so I juxtapose these uh, two works to reinforce something that he created as a 13-year-old versus something he created as a 65-year-old. Um, and there's a, you know, very famous quote that Picasso said it took him roughly four years to become an academic artist, and it took him his lifetime to learn how to, you know, create and paint like a child. And I think this juxtaposition reinforces that um, idea. Turning to playfulness and experimentation also evolved much, you know, in Picasso's career after he had already, you know, looked to the styles of the time. So he moved as a young man to Barcelona, uh, where he was influenced by artists like toulouse lautrec He then moved to Paris. And in this early time period of his life in the 1900s, um, he basically was you know, engaging with, you might say mimicking, creating dialogue with uh, the art of the time. And again, we think about artists like toulouse lautrec uh, and Matisse, and many others who had played a strong influence around this time period. And so in order for him to kind of evolve and get into a, a style of his own, he had to kind of go through these sort of academic training into the contemporary art, and then get into what we, we know uh, associated with his more unique style of the blue period, where he uh, was really interested in figurative work, including this portrait of his friend, Casa Jamas in a juxtaposition, sort of thinking about the meaning of life. His friend had just passed away, and so he's thinking about this very deep and um, tumultuous topic. Also moves into what we now come to call the Rose Period, where it's a little bit more playful. It still has aspects of that Blue Period melancholy, but it's, the palette has changed, and he's working kind of with the uh, tension uh, of performers that, you know, again, have these sort of different uh, performative and personality qualities. And then really around the time period of 1905, he starts to move into uh, a time period that I think has a lot of influence that carries over into how we might talk about um, cultural influences on his work in ceramics. He turns to uh, ancient art of the Bi Iberian Peninsula, looking at sculpted heads, does play a really integral role in his portrait of the famous American poet Gertrude Stein, You'll see a photo of her with her two brothers, Leo and Michael, there to kind of give you reference to you know, her actual look versus Picasso's rendering, that sort of simplified eye line uh, and facial features. Again, come back to those uh, influences from Iberian sculptures. Uh, and I should say Picasso was someone who learned immensely by going to museums. We know there's a lot of records of him starting visits to the Louvre as early as 1900 and making it a large uh, part of his, you know, education throughout his lifetime. So not surprising that he is having those kinds of things integral to his career. The other thing that I think is important about playfulness and experimentation is to remember that it's embedded in one of the most famous movements we associate with Picasso, and that's cubism. Analytic cubism, uh, as it developed with uh, Picasso and George Brock, who we'll get to in the next section, um, really was looking at this idea of what does it mean to think about three-dimensional and fourth-dimensional time components to a composition, which is to say you might look at the sitter, in this case, uh, Ambrose Ballard, uh, one of the dealers actually of Picasso's work at the time, um, and to sort of think about his sort of physical structure and sort of recreate it on a canvas in a much more abstracted way. The fourth dimension, kind of thinking about time, the time component, as in you can see, you know, multiple viewpoints, multiple sort of three-dimensional aspects uh, of this individual at the same time is so integral to the period of analytic cubism. 
It's playful, it's complicated, right? Uh, it makes your eye work. And, and that kind of activity is something, again, carries through uh, his career. A little bit later, uh, both Brock and Picasso start to think about a slightly different usage of cubism, uh, what uh, critics at the time and historians have come to call synthetic cubism, and that was a synthesis of many of the different experiments they were working on um, over many years. This uh, stage of cubism also involves brighter colors. It involves, um, you know, pointillism, that kind of pointed uh, dots of, of paint in some of the areas that you'll see. You still have, again, that sort of playfulness, but you also have the use uh, of words and letters that play more, even more prominent role uh, in the composition. You'll see the letters J-O-U right in the middle of this painting. And that's a truncation of the word le journal, uh, which translates to the newspaper in French, but also relates to the verb jouer, which is to play in French. And so you always you know, can be sort of thinking about that idea of playfulness and experimentation as it literally is verbalized uh, in some of these works. Just another example um, of how that synthetic cubism develops. Very early on, Picasso was, uh, you know, playing with ideas of composition, and so uh, and photographs played an important role in that, sort of documenting um, different sort of arrangements. In this case, of instruments um, in his studio, he also played with uh, and, uh, transient materials like cardboard and paper that you see here, again, another studio shot that then eventually becomes a more permanent object uh, in the sense it's made with sheet metal and wire uh, or wood. So those are just ideas of playfulness and experimentation that I want you to keep in mind when you go upstairs to see the exhibition. Um, of course, in the selection that we have upstairs, you see other, what historians have called traditional iconography of Picasso's ceramics where there's a lot of animals um, and they become, again, a vehicle through which to kind of explore the world with uh, new eyes. And so while he might not be creating instruments, as we see in the many phases of or still life and the phases of uh, cubism, we do see there's this inherent playfulness and experimentation that's so important to this practice that happens in the 60s through his 80s. So the second topic, the culture of collaboration. It's really important to understand that Picasso's work um, in ceramics owes much of its um, success to the Ramier family. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion in the current uh, newest exhibition catalog of his ceramics that talks about his connection with Suzanne Ramier. She was a ceramicist. Um, she also drew upon uh, long, rich visual heritage of ceramic practices, not only of the region, but also in terms of ancient Mediterranean sculptures. She shared catalogs and postcards with Picasso. And so we know there's much more of a strong collaboration, uh, artistic collaboration between the two of them talking through different objects. Um, Georges Ramier also was in the studio oftentimes when Picasso was working um, a lot of the platters and indeed the vessels were pre-thrown so he could work with them already made. And then some were manipulated as well. So there's a real importance of collaboration, both artistic and also practical in terms of the work that we see. Um, but this is also predated with a very rich collaboration that Picasso had with Georges Brock, uh, a fellow painter who was from France, um, who he worked with in the early part of the 1900s. Uh, Picasso had a studio at the Bateau Lavoir. It's also where he lived for a period of years. Um, there were a lot of artists in that environment. And so it helped to kind of create and foster this sense of discussion and collaboration that we know emerges to have, you know, sort of close um, resonance in terms of Brock and Picasso's work in 1908 and 1909 when they're just starting to really sort of think about three-dimensionality and those sort of language um, that they're, that's eventually gonna evolve into analytic cubism. They also were in discussion, so to speak, with uh, elder artist Paul Cezanne who passed away in 1906. And as often is the case, 
um, with these artists around the turn of the century, 20, 19th to 20th century, there were large scale exhibitions uh, of Cezanne's work. And so Picasso and Brock had the opportunity to kind of see, you know, a huge production of what Cezanne had um, done of, over the course of his lifetime. And so they're creating also a kind of collaboration uh, with someone like Cezanne. So they're in discussion and discourse with him um, as they are starting to develop analytic cubism. Their work, Brock and Picasso, has become so close, they tied together, that by 1911, they're not signing their work. And so William Rubin, a uh, curator at the uh, MoMA in New York, did a large-scale exhibition on that kind of seminal time period. It also included these really interesting works of collage, or pasted paper, papier collet, that again, enabled this playfulness, experimentation, also resonance uh, of collaboration to create new types of visual forms. And you have aspects of that analytic cubism kind of blurring the boundaries of space, as well as color, high key color, and all the also printed material that add to the intrigue of these works. And that moved for Picasso into more interest in sculptural works. And I think that that also, even though this is dated to 1914, you know, many decades later has an influence on how we sort of thinking about three-dimensionality with ceramics. And again, this is just a shot of the exhibition of stairs where you see this amazing layout of platters and of vessels um, that again, reinforce some of those same ideas of collaboration. He's also, you know, hasn't left completely aspects of cubism. We might sort of think about um, this plate, the four and, uh, enlaced profiles as sort of an intrigue for that idea of the fourth dimension, right? So even though it's a two-dimensional object, he is thinking about three-dimensionality and also the kind of fourth dimension of time as you can kind of look at these profiles and kind of think about them as being kind of an intrigue uh, for those multi-dimensional um, characters. This is probably my favorite section, which is tracking Picasso's sources of inspiration. Um, we know, uh, again, from a long established history of uh, inquiry into the subject by scholars like Jack Flam, William Rubin, and many others, that Picasso and other artists of the early 20th century were really looking outside the geographic boundaries of Europe uh, for influence on their sort of artistic practices. This goes back to collections of West African sculpture and masks that we know were in the collection of Andre Durand, a fellow artist of Matisse who was working in the movement of Fauvism, um, and many others, uh, art critics and, and gallerists also were commonly collecting uh, works of art from parts of Africa, oftentimes West Africa, and that had great influence on Picasso's paintings of the time. We know, of course, as I mentioned earlier, that he was interested in ancient art of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and then we might turn to other kind of ceramic examples where he's starting to sort of think about in drawn form, uh, you know, kind of the, the museum of his mind, right? All those things that he had seen at the Louvre that had great influence on him over many decades. So I have an example here to get you involved to think about which are the works uh, that are influence and which of the works might be actually by Picasso. So I'm curious to know what you think. Which one, let's start with, which one is by Picasso? You can raise your hand. The one on the left, okay? All right, we have two. So how many say the one on the left? Raise your hand. Right, and the other is on the right. Or majority. Well, the majority wins, you're right. <laughs> it is the work on the far right, but it is to say that he had great influence from a wide variety of sources. This is just a couple of them that reinforced this idea as we're thinking about earthenware uh, from the Minoan period in ancient Greece that had great influence on the products that he made, in this case in 1948, and also in Valores. We can also track other examples. Um, you know, Picasso's portraiture of women is a large topic uh, of his work from uh, early period, uh, including the blue period through surrealism through to his contemporary work 
uh, in the latter part of his life. Um, and some of that influence comes from Greek earthenware that he was looking to um, and sort of thinking about adaptations of it, uh, in particular this Four Seasons vessel from 1950. It has multiple sides to it, but it gives that sort of reinforced sort of texture and color tone that he's uh, looking to, uh, again, collections of the lead of uh, ancient Greek work. We might talk about more um, prevalent uh, subject matter that comes through in terms of looking to the Spanish heritage and portrayals of the bull and bullfighting its symbolism. It also has um, great resonance and connection to past ancient Greek vessels. Uh, and sculpture that you see here, again, in connection with uh, the bowl that you see upstairs and also another platter where this becomes uh, an important component to his work. This is a lunchtime lecture and I'm often asked um, what's always my favorite work uh, in the show. And I'm kind of uh, partial to the three sardines. I like the playfulness of it. It also has strong uh, visual connection to earlier examples of Renaissance ceramics that Picasso would have known, again, through the sources of publications and museums. Um, and again, sort of thinking about, you know, what's for dinner, what's for lunch is something that is part of a larger tradition of these sort of uh, platter ceramics that was produced again at this um, workshop that Picasso was so integrally tied to. So I would love to open it up to your discussion and questions. Those are my three lessons from Picasso, just to reinforce the idea of experimentation. I, I think it's important when artists move out of their main medium that there's a strong tendency that they spark innovation. Uh, it, it helps to sort of create fresh eyes that also um, transitions into other work, helps them to kind of think about new traditions and to um, you know, move out of the sort of the tensions they might have in their main field. Picasso himself was very interested in those types of explorations. He worked in drawing and printmaking, painting, uh, ceramics, and sculpture. Um, and then, of course, worked collaboratively and also looked to many influences that helped to sort of spur and elongate uh, his very long and successful career. So thank you so much. And I'm open to questions and discussion. Yes, please. Yeah, great question. Uh, oftentimes that's, the first question is kind of, you know, what is he actually making with his hands? And that's important to sort of thinking about his ceramics. Um, a lot of the vessels were in plates were already made. So there was a coterie of products that the workshop, um, the door workshop helped establish. So you can see in some of these uh, photographs here that, you know, he's working with a pre-made plate and then he's working oftentimes with slip, which is a, you know, a liquid um, clay that helps to build up a drawing, if you will. So he's oftentimes, again, kind of engraving in uh, a freshly made plate and then adding that slip to add that emphasis. And you see lots of good examples upstairs. Um, some of the vessels were pre-thrown, but then he was able to sort of move and adapt them. And that includes these birds, uh, bird size and bird uh, objects um, that he's working with. So you know, the majority of it is that that's where his collaboration is so key that he has that ceramic studio already established. They're helping to make a lot of those pre-made forms and then he's adapting them. Um, there are also instances where he made designs and then the structures were made, the vessels were made, and then he's able to go in and paint and decorate them later. So many layers of that kind of engagement. Yeah. Good question. He was professionally trained. Um, so he was formally trained in an uh, academic environment. His father was uh, our professor 
So he learned, um, you know, to render the human figure in a highly realistic fashion. He's doing that at the age of 12, you know, thinking about human torsos and, uh, and portraits of, of local people at the age of 13. So he, he showed, you know, very early on the ability to kind of replicate things in a very realistic fashion. And that carries over, you know, when he's starting to work independently as a young man in Barcelona, but he's also then turning to art of the current time period by artists like Toulouse Lautrec to kind of take that same um, prowess in terms of knowing how to replicate reality, but then also to borrow from other you know, current um, post-impressionist and focused um, designs. And you see that like in this just a little uh, array of early work by him um, that he's kind of merging those skills. And then it really is about kind of turning to unlearning some of those skills. And that's where we get to the influence of Iberian sculpture. But I guess what I'd say is in every step of unlearning, he always has a model or an example, uh, an influence that is kind of the track to get him to that place. So it's not just purely out of his imagination. He's a very much, I would say, kind of a museum scholar who's always keeping this, you know, encyclopedia of work he's seen in person or in publication to help him into easing into each of these new experimental zones. So yes, yeah, very academically trained, but then you might say independently selective about how he starts to move into um, places that, again, are, are more experimental. Thank you. Well, it's a good question. Um, let me come back to another image here. Yes, the question was um, that he produced about 4,000 works during this time period of 1946 to 1971. And, you know, is, is there more after that? And the, the short answer is no, because he was already um, 89 by the time he finished working in ceramics and he passed away at the age of 91. So he worked in this 25 year time period in his sixties to his late eighties. And so I also think that that's really important when we kind of think about the longevity of his work is that he was still very, very active up until the very final years. But that's why 1971 is kind of the cutoff period and 1973 is the year that he passed. So good question. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So analytic cubism, um, you might say it, the seeds for it start in this portraiture from roughly 1905 to 1906 in that the palette for analytic cubism becomes really monochrome. There's a really a kind of duration of um, gray and or sort of earthen tones that help to kind of de-emphasize de the kind of expected contours that we have in, let's say, a portrait of this sort, even though the palette is similar. They worked, both Brock and Picasso, with this idea of a scaffolding that helps to kind of hang features or, you know, aspects of an instrument on a, um, a scaffold that's on, you might say, recreated on the canvas so that you have a sense of all these multiple facets of dimensionality, right? And that enables this idea that you see, in this case, a portrait of Ambrose, Ambrose Vallard from multiple perspectives at the same time, right? So we're kind of looking down on the top of his forehead we're also getting a good sense of his frontal facial characteristic. His body has kind of really kind of morphed into multiple planes. And that kind of experimentation of basically taking what you see in reality and recreating it so you see multiple viewpoints at the same time is inherent to analytic cubism. 
And this is the time period when Brock and Picasso are working so closely with one another in studio practice that they stop signing their work because it's really not about who made what, it's more about this idea of like really getting it right. Synthetic cubism has been characterized as synthesizing many more components. So it still takes that aspect of analytic cubism in the sense that you see an object, in this case, in a still life from multiple perspectives, but now you put it back into some of the characteristic expectations of the genre of still life, right? We see that these objects are on a table of sorts, even though the table is slanted towards us. You do see that it's a collection of objects, so they're a little more identifiable. The palette changes, it has higher sort of more vibrant colors, and they start to use texture more readily in the sense they're using kind of points of paint, they're using, you know, um, different sort of techniques of sort of showing a frame. And a lot of that comes from this stage of papier coulé. So this happens in between analytic and synthetic cubism. So if you ins insert this um, as experiments around 1910 to 1912, they're using wallpaper, music, pre-printed pieces of um, newspaper, and, and those types of uh, inspirations help to kind of make what we call synth synthetic cubism. It's a synthesis of all the things they've been basically working on from 1907 <laughs> to, to the early teens. There are many others. There's one Greek, there's many other painters that start to work in that phase, but a little bit later. So Brock and Picasso really are the ones that are starting to create a trend. Uh, their work is written about by critics like Roger Fry as early as 1910. There's a long coterie of um, art writers that help to basically create interest in cubism. It also um, in some ways becomes an albatross. It's like the actor who stars in a in a key role and you know, that actor is trying to get away from that persona. Uh, so cubism became a real sort of solidified movement in arts literature in the teens. And then it became something that, again, I think that work of playfulness and experimentation working in ceramics you know, kind of helped to, to quell that idea that he was only linked to cubism. Great question. Yes, a great question. So my understanding is part of the initial collaboration was that he would have access to working at the studio um, and provide designs that they could then manufacture. And then the collaboration um, was linked originally to sales. But, you know, 25 years is a really long time period. And so what evolved was also kind of artistic collaboration. And the newest catalog talks specifically about Suzanne Ranier's work. And I would love to see more like an exhibition on that subject, right? I'd love to see her work in connection with Picasso's work and to kind of get a sense of the shared uh, visual materials that um, were integral to their discussions. Uh, there's a specific catalog um, that she, of uh, uh, an exhibition that she saw that, that she then shared with Picasso, for example. And, you know, things like that would be really interesting to learn more about and how long those discussions lasted for. Um, I think the fact that he was actively sketching from 46 to 53 is kind of the key time period uh, when I would expect that their collaboration was maybe the closest. Um, and so, yeah, it opens the door to a lot more research. And some of the essays in this newest catalog, you know, are really looking at those archival materials. And there's a lot of documentation surprisingly so, of the things that were in each of their collections. So, more study. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. 
that's a great question. So there winds up being, you know, series, so to speak, of these works. Um, some of them are one of a kind. Some of them are unique. Uh, and so it's a, it's a way to say that even if there's a series, say, of this engraved bowl plate, um, it's going to, each one's going to be relatively unique, even though it might sort of follow that each of the plates is going to be yellow. It's going to each have an engraved um, drawing of a bull, and then that's going to be basically glazed with this greenish tone. They're all going to be unique on their own, but there are definite series that emerge from this to make 4,000. They, they did in some cases, yes. In some cases, they, there are multiples of them. And that's how you get, if you um, look at, you know, if you, if you Google Picasso ceramics online, you will find multiple versions of the same owl, but they're not always exactly the same because they're still done by hand. So, you know, even though the studio, um, the workshop would have created, you know, vessels that look exactly alike, right? And you can see photographs of that. Then Picasso is going to come and paint them relatively the same but there are going to be manipulations. Maybe, you know, this wing is a little bit higher and maybe this beak is a little bit longer. So not like prints of a painting because there's still the hand that applies the decor decoration. Um, there's still, you know, slip, for example, you know, kind of liquid clay um, doesn't do the same thing every single time, <laughs> right? So if you have that fish platter that has, it's basically made with slip, um, you know, some areas might be a little bit thicker than others. So that's a whole nother realm, I think, of Picasso ceramics as it's become more of interest within the last five years or so, is that people are now starting to compare, you know, work that was made during the same year, or um, like you said, these series of works to kind of see which ones they prefer over others. And that comes also from auction house records as well. So it's a field of art history called connoisseurship. And so a lot of attention goes into um, the kind of aesthetic quality uh, of, of an object. And so there's a lot more attention to that now that they're so much more popular. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. How does he um, turn to birds uh, in particular? I think um, the examples I brought in as sort of seeing, thinking about these sort of figurative vessels had a really strong um, connection to a history of ceramics that dated many centuries earlier. But uh, Picasso was also interested in the topic of peace doves. This was a popular topic that he painted and, and drew and worked in prints on. Um, the vessel shape, as you say, also kind of lends itself to that imagination. Um, I also think it's an opportunity from, for him to break out of some of the expected content that he had done over the course of his career. So you'll find upstairs um, the topic of goat, birds, fish, <laughs> other animals that kind of spark the imagination and reinforce this kind of playfulness and departure from what might have been kind of his more serious day job or serious uh, evolution in painting, right? Um, when we think about uh, cubism, for example, there are no birds <laughs> in cubism. It's much more this idea of the genre of the still life and the figurative sort of uh, portrait. Um, and so ceramics lends itself to thinking more about um, these playful subject matter that again, do have resonance in terms of other models, but also allow for that creativity um, to come through. And I think that's the role of those birds plays that integral role. Thank you. Yes, thank you for coming and head upstairs again to get another view of the exhibition. <laughs>